there. Uh, we're going to get underway. Uh, I'm Jim Truer. I'm going to talk about myself in just a second. Uh, but we're going to talk about test and PowerShell. I did. Actually, I didn't hit the button. Somebody else hit the button on my behalf. Um, so that was very nice. Uh, I was an original member of the PowerShell team. In fact, if you remember Jeffrey talking uh, yesterday, he mentioned uh, the services for Unix and this uh, Unix environment running on the POSIX subsystem. I actually came to Microsoft through that acquisition. So I had been working uh, for a company called Software Systems uh, on uh, a Unix personality on the NT microkernel at the time. And it was real Unix. Uh, we were about ready to go past the Unix uh, conformance tests and all the rest when we were acquired. Before that, I had worked for Silicon Graphics, Sun, uh, a company called Interactive Systems, and I was a Unix guy for, uh, before I, before I uh, started on uh, any of the Windows stuff. And in fact, I was the prototypical user for PowerShell because I was one of those guys that said, what can you do with this Windows platform? There's nothing to do. You can't do anything to it. And I have to use my mouse. I don't know what a mouse is. God, get out, get out, get rid of it. So um, when the opportunity to work on PowerShell <coughs> uh, came along, I jumped at it because I thought it would be really uh, an awesome approach to uh, system management and, and automation for the Windows platform. And I think I'm, I, I still, I'm still right about that for the record. Uh, Bruce Payette and I created the scripting language. The uh, initial, uh, for those of you that like languages and whatnot. The initial BNF was created out of the POSIX uh, shell BNF. That's where I started. That's where the language started. And the behavioral model of the shell was along the POSIX, uh, along the POSIX lines. The behavior that I wanted to kind of <coughs> get on Windows. I didn't want to have strict POSIX because it was too, too uh, confining. But uh, that's where I wanted to start because those are the guys I was pointing at myself that I needed to woo onto the platform because a, a good shell is the thing that, that really uh, uh, really helps somebody get work done. I also worked on, uh, uh, I was also the program manager uh, for the uh, session state, the errors. I uh, was the first program manager there, so I did a lot. Uh, uh, the first user guide I wrote. And uh, then we shipped version one, and I started working on remoting. Uh, to make sure that we could do remoting. And then I, uh, I have ADHD, right? So oh, something shiny showed up. And so I said, ooh, Microsoft Research. I'll go do that. And so I went actually to Microsoft Research and worked in Microsoft Research on a, uh, a product incubation on uh, telephone um, uh, switches uh, for small businesses. And so that closed. And then I went to the <coughs> System Center Service Manager Group and uh, from the service, and at that point, I continued to write code all the time. Throughout all of this period, I'm writing code. And program managers that write code, they could possibly do better things with their time. So I decided to move into a different discipline. And uh, I chose the test discipline because it's the Wild West in test. And you can pretty much uh, write as much code as you can possibly generate. And you don't have an awful lot of rules. You should have some rules, and that's one of the reasons why I went there is because I wanted to make sure we had some rules. So I moved to Office as a tester, working on the Office 365 ser backend services, working in Azure, working with uh, getting uh, Office licensing up, uh, uh, up so it actually worked. And, uh, and finally, I had the opportunity to come back to the PowerShell team, and I jumped at it because it's a, it's a product I continue to use. Even when I wasn't on the team, I was proselytizing it within Microsoft, no matter where I was. And uh, I had an opportunity to come back to the PowerShell organization as a tester. And I really, really thought that would be awesome. So here I'm back again. Oh, yes, that's right. I'm also, uh, 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 like I said, I like shiny things. So I actually did studio singing as a career for a while. I did some movies and television and radio and and you can buy a Michael Jackson album and hear me and blah, blah, blah. So uh, I don't get any money for that. But if you go out and rent Empire of the Sun, I get a check for that. So go out and do that. <laughs> so what are we going to cover here? Um, I, I want to share with you the infrastructure that Microsoft uses to test PowerShell. I think it's incredibly fascinating. It's grown up over 12 years. 
and that has a lot of positives and negatives, as you can well imagine, after a, of a code base that continually uh, changes uh, over a 12-year period. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that, and we're going to drill in just a little bit into the Microsoft script frameworks, because I want to talk about Pester, which is another script-based framework for unit tests that if you're not using, you ought to be using. In fact, I want to know how many of you have heard of Pester? Excellent. How many of you have written uh, more than one test case in Pester? Good for you guys. How many of you actually written an entire suite in Pester? That's what I thought. <laughs> one. So uh, I'm going to show you how, uh, one, you can take advantage of Pester with your existing scripts, and then how to take whatever tests you might have uh, and, and, and re-implement them in Pester. And then finally, I'm going to talk about where we need to go from a test perspective because of the way the business is changing and the way that we deliver software. So I'm going to talk about testing Nirvana in the future. This is how I feel when I come to work every day. <laughs> it's my role to make sure that we put out the best quality that, I po that Microsoft possibly can. And I take it incredibly seriously. <coughs> and uh, every one of you that releases software need to make sure, no matter how you release it, whether it's casually released or whether it's uh, uh, formally released, you need to be sure that you can understand the quality of what you're building. It's not quite enough to, uh, to touch test. That's the first step. But you need to have a set of things that you do all the time against your, your software. I'm sure that you all test your software. But I don't know how, how you all rigorously test your software. I hope you are very rigorous about your, your testing. How many of you are using any sort of test framework in your environment? So you should all be using some sort of framework in your <laughs> environment. How many of you actually created a test framework? That's, that's kind of a problem, right? <laughs> it, it's, I, I know you all write perfect code, and your code doesn't need to be tested. But your customers do things with your products that you have no idea. And your customer might be you know, the guy you're sharing a script with, script with or some sort of business associate. And they're going to do things that you have no idea. They're going to get into states that you have no idea how they got there. So it's really important that you take a, an approach that has a little bit of rigor uh, when you, when you, because this way uh, you can feel like him too. So let's talk about Microsoft. Um, let's talk about Microsoft and how much testing we actually do. This is the core uh, PowerShell team and the test uh, tests that we do. This organ, this does not include the DS. This th these numbers do not include the DSC test. They do not include the tests that are run by other people that are creating PowerShell commandlets and modules. This is just the core <coughs> uh, PowerShell team. So we have 100,000 tests, 98,900, whatever it is, 99,000, and it grows every day. It's actually an underestimate because the way we write <laughs> tests is not as, ri not as rigorous as it could be. There's a, couple of, there's a couple of tests that actually test about 150 different types of behavior. So a single test that we call a test, tests between 150 and 200. I can't remember the number. It's a very, very large number. So you can imagine that um, when we do a full test pass, it actually takes uh, more than 18 hours to run all of our tests, depending on the sort of hardware we have. I want to talk about that in a little bit. If you think about how much software you 50 engineers can create over 12 years, and that's just the test team, you can start to imagine how much the code has changed from the version one to now. When we initially started this, we had a small set of, of script-based tests. We had a, a built a script framework to run script-based tests. In fact, all of the parser tests, for example, are scripts that we run. But we also have a very large, large number of compiled C-sharp tests. Essentially, what those tests do is they spin up a run space. They create a pipeline. They stick a command on the pipeline. They stick some parameters and some values on the pipeline. 
and then they call the pipeline invoke, they collect the results, and they test uh, the results and make sure that they get the value that they're, that they're getting to. And in fact, the provider tests, the 43,000 provider tests, nearly all of those are C-sharp sorts of tests. Well, there's a couple of issues there. Uh, uh, it requires a, a test infrastructure to spin up all of these tests. And it, in fact, the test harness that we have is called T-test. Is anyone familiar with T-test? It, it is a public thing. So people, uh, it has been used and uh, released into the wild, I believe. It uses reflection, and it's a very convoluted sort of thing. Uh, but when you have 60,000 of those tests and you're spinning up run spaces, all of that takes a lot of time. And so for each one of these invocations, it takes, it takes a considerable amount of time, especially if you're doing, like I say, 42,000 of them in providers. And the, uh, a number of the different areas, the scripting has a bunch of them, uh, remoting has a bunch of C-sharp tests, base tests. So when you start to look at that, you start to sort of understand the, the, the colossal nature of how much test you have to do. And we still don't have 100% coverage. We still have risk in the product. So we'd like to have 250,000 tests if we could, but then we'd have to execute them. And that would be 36 hours to do a test run. So it's all about, it's all about risk management. And I should say, one of the reasons that we have so many tests is because when we first started this and build, when we first started to build PowerShell, one of the primary goals of PowerShell was to make sure it was easily testable. That that was, that what was it, number three in the list? Jeffrey, is that right? Two, no, it was number two in the list? Security, Se security testability uh, was the top two priorities when we started to build PowerShell. And, and it's written in such a way that you can really automate the crap out of it. And that's the coolness, of, that's the cool thing about it. And when we were building it, we wanted to make sure that we could test it. So that's one of the reasons why we have so many tests. And from a perspective in, in Microsoft, I think when we started, we said, yeah, we want code coverage numbers. I remember saying, yeah, I think 75% is where we should start. 75% code coverage, which is, I can tell you in Office, Maybe I shouldn't tell you in office. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> Jeffrey's saying no. It's not seventy-five percent. <laughs> it's less than that. Um, but ha having that sort of approach means that when we release software, we have a really, really good handle on measuring the quality that our customers are getting to get. We're moving to an environment now where you look at the way we release software at a much more rapid pace, which means that that while we don't have 18 months to find all the edges, we'll make up with that by releasing more often. But it does mean that as you get the software in your hands, you might see edges that weren't found because we haven't got, been able to get there yet. But if you think about the longevity of the releases, you can say, OK, we're not going to we release with this bug in September, but in October we'll fix it, or November we'll fix that, instead of waiting September of 2014, well, we'll fix that by November of 2015. We can actually fix that from month to month to month. It does mean that you have to be really careful when you accept the software. And so you need to validate that the scenarios that you are going to be looking at are going to be satisfied with the software we're releasing and let us know when it's not. So that's kind of a responsibility that you need to make sure that you uphold for us to make sure that in, uh, in combination, we make a really great product moving month to month or every, every quarter. Uh, you don't hesitate to ask questions in the middle of all of this. Uh, I'd much rather have this be uh, uh, more di of a dialogue than anything else. Yes? So do you, since you are, if you're going to have quick release cycles, and is your te test coverage going to be the exact same? Or will you uh, have to do a lesser test coverage to manage? Well, the, the way the test coverage, we won't do less test coverage. What the test coverage will trail because we won't be able to catch up as much. We will have exit gates. So certain things, when we release a piece of software, we will be able to describe the quality. We will be able to measure it and, and then describe it. But we may release with bugs we know about. And those will be public? And Well, it'll be part of the release notes. I mean, yeah, it'll be, I mean, will, will they, I mean, are there known bugs that will, will you 
you say here here are some known issues, uh, so that or is it up to the the people receiving to find them and well, then report them? We'll know. We'll report on what we know, okay. but our knowledge isn't going to be as comprehensive because we won't have four months to test it. We'll have three weeks to test it. So that, that's, a, that's a really personal question about the disclosure of the bugs because I think we all know things are moving faster and there will be bugs and that's the trade-off for moving faster, but other product teams know about bugs and don't publish them. Yeah. I, I, so you can't speak to that, I appreciate. I, I can't speak to the, the policy statements. I know what, my in, what I'm trying to influence and I think I think that we're all adults and we need to be really pretty pr transparent about that change and so you knowing that we know is a good thing Yeah, because that's the thing that we don't want to have happen is that you know keep these things like secrets and not share them because they could be bad news well the fact of the matter is you're going to find it so it's going to be known so if we know we should we'll we'll share and that's what we have done all along if you look at the the readme's in our in our uh, ctps we're pretty clear about the bugs that we find. Well, yeah. I just wanted to uh, take issue with the if we move faster that there's going to be more bugs. I don't think that's necessarily true. It, if you're working in smaller iterations, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have more bugs. I, I, if I said that. No, you, you didn't. Oh, no, no, no I, I, I didn't. I didn't want to. I, I didn't know what what it meant. I just that's why I want to get to it. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I it doesn't can necessarily mean that because I mean if you have I mean you can I guess you can number of lines of code uh, you can count the number of bugs right but sure the ratio there yeah I can tell you that we definitely before we release a piece of software we run through a complete test pass of the code that we've written just that last little bit of caveat is what's important <laughs> but the QA is potentially lower but the, the more more of an automated suite that you have, the less time you need to run that. You can run those tests more frequently. You have you might have less time for interactive testing. But, yeah. Those things take a while. So they, they do. So it, it's. I don't want to suggest. I'm not suggesting that we're putting out less quality software. I don't want to suggest that at all. What I'm what I'm saying is that. There's a gap between how much time we have and how much time we want. Yeah. And all of that is deciding what we can get to in the time that we have. We used to have three years. Now we have two months or three months. We do less, but we're still chasing, right? Question. Yeah, besides that, there are also previews. So yeah, you should take that into account when using it. You should have used it in production. Absolutely. I mean, they are they are previews. They're not. It, it, we want to get the feedback. We want you to make sure that we're headed in the right direction. We want to be sure that you have an opportunity to look at it. Yes, absolutely. And the feedback is just through Microsoft Connect, right? Uh, yes, the uh, feedback is through Microsoft Connect. I should probably be repeating the questions, shouldn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering if it's synonymous with hotfixes to SPs for the OS. We used to have hotfixes uh, that were you know, regression tested for that specific scenario, but they weren't uh, integration tested. At, like an SP service pack would be? Is that sort of, uh, would you sort of say this release cycles are sort of like hot fixes? Well, the, so the release, the question is, are the release cycles uh, synonymous with hot fixes and, and service packs? And the answer to that is really no. Uh, it's still part of the development cycle. So these, these CTPs are snapshots of where we are in the development process. Because we still do have releases. Jeffrey, if you yes, so so our preview releases are high quality releases that you can put in production, but they have a different SLA associated with them. It is a fixed forward SLA. When we put something in the operating system, we'll hot patch that. When the operating system gets hot hot patch or fixed, you know we do a bunch of regression tests. That's not the same case with the previews. We have problem with the preview, let us know. We'll attempt to fix that, and then we'll put that fix in the next major version of the preview. And I can tell you for sure that anything that comes along that way, that will wind up as part of the test suite, so we'll catch that in the future. So we definitely roll all of those things forward. You had a question? Yeah, it's hands up. Okay. Yes, Jeffrey. What's on the next slide? 
<laughs> so let me go back to where we were with the, uh, the, our test frameworks. We initially had uh, a, a test framework called uh, Light 1.1, and then it turned into 1.2. <coughs> It was a script-based testing environment. It was a fairly simple framework which executed scripts. We're going to actually look at one of those scripts in a, in a few moments. <laughs> and uh, that lasted for uh, a, a release. And the next release, we made it better because we had more better, control, better understanding of how modules worked. And we created a, a module-based test environment called Light 3, which was uh, uh, the next iteration of the Light framework. And those are, uh, we're going to talk, we're going to look at that. And if you're familiar with Pester, they're going to look very familiar. Uh, I think they were parallel uh, strands of, of, uh, of development. I'm not sure when Pester was done, but I know Light 3 is a couple of years old, is a year old or more. And they look very, very similar. So there's a, there's a um, the couple of things that, that about the, these frameworks is that over time they grow. And the light, the light one framework was actually pretty tidy. It had a couple of a script, uh, uh, had a couple of scripts that would be dot sourced into the test, uh, and then you would run your tests. And we had a harness that actually executed the tests. And then um, because of that, the debugging was a little tricky. Uh, uh, it was oftentimes di more difficult to figure out where the bug was. Was it in the framework or was it in the in the product? We, that's kind of a that's kind of a problem, and uh, um, then with Light three we moved on to uh, uh, a module based uh, a module based testing environment which tidied things up a little bit uh, allowed uh, allowed the packaging to be quite a bit easier. At the same time we also made it very extendable. The Light three Light three uh, framework is very extendable. We have t three different logging. Uh, uh, modules that we can use with uh, with Light 3. I'll show you uh, two of them. Um, and with, and, it, and like Pester, when you create a, a test, you're actually executing a script block. Uh, similar to Pester, uh, uh, it has the same sort of, sort of issues that, it, that uh, Pester does. So I'll take a look. Now we'll talk a little bit about Pester, which is an awesome, <coughs> awesome uh, uh, behavior-driven uh, test framework, which is pretty pretty cool. Scott uh, and Manoj did a great job of, of producing this. Uh, there's other guys, of course, but uh, these are the guys that are in the copyright file. Um, the one of the great things about Pester is that that it's uh, very easy to author. If you're not authoring Pester tests, go find Pester. It's downloadable. Go author a couple of tests. They're really easy. Start using it. Start the more you use it, the better the better you'll get with it, of course. Uh, and the authoring is very very good. Uh, it's simple. The the other thing that's pretty amazing about Pester is it's built as a documentation engine to start. So when you build a test, you actually describe what the test is as part of creating the test. And you describe what the test does. I'll show you this in, a, in, a, in, a de in the demo when we come up to it, which is really awesome because documenting what your tests do is the kind of the second thing you need to have. First, you need to know what you want to test and figure out well, how to do that. But then you also want to keep a record of how you are doing that. So you remember that you've written these tests. Um, it has this mock-up capability. So if you actually don't have in your environment the functionality that you need, you can actually mock up a function to return a value, a dummy value. So if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, call out to some sort of external source, you can actually mock that into a function, and it will return you whatever values that you program into your function, mock function. And that way, you can actually really uh, not have to worry about resources that aren't available or part of your test environment. So you can mock these things up. It's very useful. Um, this bullet here, extendable, it's, it's very extendable, it's a script module. And one of the things that's pretty cool is that, that uh, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft and VMware, VMware has this huge PowerShell support, we use their, their modules and commands. We've agreed to work with the community, and um, like, like community and Apache, 
uh, we will work with the, the pester community to add, extend it, uh, participate in the community, participate in the bug fixes and see what needs to be done and pitch in and do that, which is pretty cool. I think it's a, a pretty amazing, uh, 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 a pretty amazing story of, of two uh, competitors kind of coming together and working uh, for the common good in uh, a publicly sourced environment. You know, Jeffrey knows a lot more about this than I do, but it's a pretty awesome, uh, awesome. The opportunities here are pretty fantastic. I'm actually really excited to see where this goes. Uh, I believe there is a meeting. Actually, the first first conference call is tomorrow. <laughs> oh no, what's today? The first conference call is 7 p.m. tonight, sorry. <laughs> Local time. Now I gotta go take the call. Um, so uh, additionally, <coughs> Pester is good because it focuses on quality. I think we don't focus enough on quality rig with enough rigor. And this allows that focus to happen and make it very easy to do. And so when you release your own software, you write some tests for it. That way, when you release that software, your customers can see the test results. Your customers can see how are you measuring how this works. What are you doing with this? How are you val validating that you need it's meeting your the, the needs? These are a really good start to ha to uh, to how to do that. So if you're not doing this yet, please uh, you want to. It makes it makes everybody happier. So at the top is a, a like three is a like is a like three uh, uh, test. I'll just walk through it a little bit. Like three is like I said this uh, module that we've built internally. We're not going to be releasing this uh, because you wouldn't want it. <laughs> uh, it yeah, right. Um, but essentially, what you do is you define a suite and you define individual test cases. So if you look at the top, suite is actually a function that takes arguments. One of the arguments that it takes is uh, the arguments that you're going to be passing, of course, and the name of the, the uh, suite along with the definition. The definition is a script block, which includes a setup block and a cleanup block and then test case block. So this, uh, there's a pointer here, is that? No, there isn't. Anyway, uh, the test case up here, that's the actual test case. We're going to validate, expand, string with escape character. There's a tag. The tag says uh, how, when, under what circumstances are this run. We have a number of different circumstances of BBT, DRTs, uh, priority one test, priority two test. So it's a different, essentially, categorization of how often do you want to run these tests. For every build, we run BBT, DRT sorts of tests. There's a good 15 or 20,000 of those uh, whenever, for every build. Uh, the, th the difference between, uh, one of the, the main differences between Likery and Pester is that we're an assert based, um, we're, we're in, a, uh, we have an assert based uh, test, which means that if the test fails, it throws and a higher level catches that and makes sure that, that, uh, uh, that it's reported. Pester does it a little bit differently, but it, it doesn't use those terms. We're going to talk about those terms. If you look down below here in the bottom half, you can see where Pester has a very similar setup where you say, describe, that's the suite, that's the set of tests that you're putting into a group. And then you have a set of tags, and I actually just use DRT. Uh, the tags are uh, a filtering. You, you can filter what tags, you want, what tests you want to run based on the tag. You name the, name the suite, and then this bit here is the actual test. It validate expand string with es escape character, never mind, should be that. So this describes not only what the test is, but what it should be. And so this code here is executed, and the result of that is piped to this evaluator, should, and then he's got some, uh, then there's some other uh, keywords, there's actually more functions, B, and then they do a comparison. If this fails, it's a report that it fails. If it succeeds, there's a report that it succeeds. In our framework, in the Microsoft Light 3 framework, 
there's no report of passing. It just doesn't fail. So it's a silent, uh, silent success. Now, there is a log file that gets generated that shows success. But uh, as a res uh, uh, user result, is, is, uh, you don't say anything. Uh, no, no, re no report is made when that a single test uh, succeeds. So as you can see, going from this to this could be done mechanically almost. So we have a lot of these tests. And I'm working now to figure out a way to move them to this environment. One of the reasons I would like to move to pass through is one, it's, you very, it's very clear about what's going on. The documentation is easier. It also allows us to more easily release software with, their te with tests. <laughs> so if we, release, if we want to release some sort of thing into the wild and we can release the pester suite, we don't have to supply our Light3 framework with all of its baggage. We can actually use something in the, in the wild, which is much easier for us. Yes? Can you describe in which scenarios you would use pester or testing? It's really a unit, it's a unit test scenario. That's really its strength. So simple, more, si more narrowly constrained tests. Yeah, but you wouldn't use it for every script you create, right? <coughs> yes. I would use it for every script that I create and release that I want someone to use. Well, the problem is businesses are, uh, uh, for now I make, most of my partial scripts are to make my own work easier. And if my colleagues use it, well, of course, it's great. So um, from a development uh, point of view, they get a, a they get a work item and someone wants a certain feature. Sure. Want certain, so it's easily testable because you know what the result of the customer wants. It's yes. It's known in front. But I'm just doing like, I don't want to click 500 times. Let me see if I can do something with it. So that's easy. That's not that easy. Make a test framework for something like yes, doing so that. Combine this thought with what you heard from Dan around our work around repositories. Mm -hmm. So agree to it. You're writing your own code. I mean, Jim's a test, right? So ignore him. <laughs> you're writing your code, you know, maybe you want to test it, maybe you don't, maybe using it's tested enough. But if you're going to take that and then share it with the community and have other people change it and modify it and then you take things back, that's the kind of environment where you definitely want to have a set of tests so that somebody can go modify your script, make sure that they don't break your original code, add their functions, etc., and expand and, and know that every, every line you write makes the code better. That's the great thing about <laughs> test frameworks. Test frameworks allow you to say, I add code in a way that didn't break things, and I add code in a way that is always making it better. Yeah, that or, or you break it in the expected way, that, that the expected things are breaking. And would, would you ship your uh, test code or uh, test the script together with your uh, script? That also, uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, goal here, the goal here is to make sure, there's a couple of goals here. One is to make sure that the consumer of the script it feels has a, is satisfied with regard to being able to measure the quality of the script that they're getting. Now that's a kind of a, kind of a slippery slope there, right? Because if you, don't, if you write a single test that doesn't do anything, it's not very useful. But by releasing the test code itself, you get to inspect what's going on there. If you're writing scripts for yourself, I can easily see how you wouldn't want to do that. But the first time I try to, the first time I want somebody else to share that, and I want them to be able to use it, I want to be sure that that whatever local changes Jeffrey say says aren't uh, don't result in a, a lot loss of, of functionality. And if you think about scripts as they change over time and the way they generally get more and more use, do more and more things, you want to be sure that you continually expand what you're testing against so it's a true measure of quality of the, of the script that's getting released to your customer. And whether your customer is, uh, if you're the customer, then you take on that risk. If you're not the customer, somebody else is the customer, then, then <coughs> they may not be willing to take on that risk. They may, but they may not. 
Steve? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's very true. The, the question, the, the statement is that if you're releasing a script and you make changes over it at some future time, the changes that you make may break the script in ways that you can't imagine, you can't foresee, and those tests can help mitigate that risk. That's absolutely true. So one of the other reasons that I, we're looking at PESTA very seriously is because we're getting a lot of pressure from internal groups to use PESTER because they see it as a very, very useful uh, unit test framework. And we don't support it internally yet. So s when we release that, that, uh, that module with the PESTER test, that's not running through any of our, our uh, test frameworks that we currently have. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is extending our current test fr framework to include uh, support for PESTER tests. There's a couple of things that we'll need to, to uh, do. As I said earlier, that adding the support for PESTER is actually pretty low. We haven't, we haven't done it yet, but it is pretty low. And um, we will have to make it, there'll be a, a, a policy change with regard to what we can call our tests. Because the way PESTER requires a certain name before it will test, uh, before it will invoke a test. So we'll change the way we name our tests. Uh, for the new tests, and uh, then we'll, once the framework is present, it should just start lighting up in our environment. And now we can actually show you. Let's see, make sure. There we go. So let's take a look. This is one of our tests. Oh, it's not. <laughs> What? Stop. Oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. A bunch of prologue. Loads the assert, dot sources the assert script and then figures out where it is and then we'll actually run through a whole bunch of tests here. And if you actually look at the business end here, can you see this okay? Is this visible all right? The business end here is that the top part of this thing, the defi definition of cases is essentially what the test cases that we're going to be doing. And then down here, we have this, uh, this is actually going to run all those tests. And then right down here, we'll actually test minus like is doing, these are the actual tests for like. And it runs through that upper function. So as you can see, when I said that this is one test, but it's actually testing the crap out of like, because it's testing all sorts of different things. So this, you could consider this one test, or perhaps you could consider it 50 tests. So if we execute it, oops, I'm still getting used to this. Ah, sorry. Back here, there we go. Execute you. That's the output. There's no result. It just simply says, yes, I tested it. Thank you. It's not quite as useful as it might be. So if we go back and run, we can wrap this by, mes by, by pester. And then we can say, let's look at this. Go. So here's how I wrapped pester. So there's a couple of things that are going to happen. I'm still executing the script in the old framework. I'm just executing it by Pester is just simply executing the script. One of the things you'll notice, one of the big things that I've changed here is this 2 greater than ampersand 1. Because of the way Pester wants to have a re is a result-based environment, Pester wants to have results. Well, my scripts don't produce any results. So I actually have to say, well, if I have an error, that's not good. And I'm going to be looking for a null. So in this particular case, my test shouldn't do anything. If I does my test does something that's broken, so this is how I, I work. I, this is how it works. I say, execute the script, and you should get nothing. And so when I execute the script, we'll go back to this thing here. Invoke pester, and we'll go back to the results. And here we go. 
So now you'll see two pieces of two pieces of output. Here's the execution line. I'm describing what I'm testing, and here's my test. This verbose spitting out verbose stuff. And this this is pester output that basically says I have executed this guy. I ran him in 100, 182 milliseconds. And oh yes, by the way, he passed. Even though I'm running 50 or so tests in there, it's a single test in this environment. So this allows me to very easily uh, uh, wrap tests. And in fact, I was going to show you, but I'm running out of time rapidly. The, um, I have a script that actually wraps all those scripts. So I can build, because it's quite mechanical, you can actually just generate the test script, a test script, pester test script, that allows all those other scripts that I might have to work. So that's kind of handy. Let's move on quickly to uh, Light 3. Let's go here, run there. This is the, this is the Light 3 test. As you'll see, it looks very similar to what we talked about. To change this to pester, <laughs> when I execute this, I should say, when I execute this guy, it looks like we do a better job. You just execute the script, he does this, and if we go back there, he now starts, light three actually kind of helps you out a little bit. It tells me that I ran all these tests, I passed the test, the test one was complete. Uh, the log file actually contains information about what tests are run. And then we have created this XML blob of, of uh, test results, which I can show you. <laughs> Back to you. And so there's a big XML that talks about how long the test took, uh, uh, where it was. This, we collect a lot more logs. So we learned a lot over the earlier years about uh, what what information was in the log and in fact if I just uh, sh quickly show you um, this is what we capture now this is very large amount of XML that describes what we did and blah 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 all of that so let's go back now, if I want to invoke this in Pester, let's take a look at this guy. So this is now the Pester script, as I showed you earlier. I showed you that earlier, and now I can just go ahead and <coughs> execute that. When I execute, uh, I use uh, this the command called invoke Pester, the command function actually, and now I'm going to be executing that script. Wham, go, and the result is back here. So, so it's very easy, very similar. The, the result similar, presentation is similar to our Light 3, uh, but that's ours and we built it. And we, if we start using Pester, we can actually start sharing these results in a way that the community can, can understand and use. And so that would be very useful for us. Okay, let's go back to you. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna test PowerShell on a toaster, PowerShell on a phone, or PowerShell on a watch. I'm probably not going to be able to copy my modules there, load them up, which may require some assemblies, which may require frameworks that can't possibly exist in the 128 KB of memory I've got. So I need a way to reduce what I have in for requirements in testing. So the first thing I want to do for light it's huge, it's 35 files and it's a half a megabyte in just in disk space. Aside from the fact that it actually loads assemblies and requires uh, compilation and blah, blah, blah. It's just, so we can't necessarily have that everywhere we're gonna test. It's also true in Pester. Pester is also module based and if you're gonna run the Pester test, you need to have the Pester framework there. And that's a couple of dozen files. It's much smaller. Doesn't, as far as I can tell, it doesn't load. It hasn't. It's not loading any assemblies. So, but you still have to have the framework there. So, in effect, what's happening is we're actually testing the framework because there'll be framework bugs, and we're testing the product. So, what I want to do is I want to just test the bit that I want. 
there are some environments that will be under test that will have access to one commandlet, no language, nothing. I want to be able to test in those environments too. What's the answer? Well, the answer is a kind of a different framework. That what I want to do is I want to be able to create a framework where I spit across the wire, because it's probably in a remoting context, only the script block to ex that needs to be executed. That's all I want there. And I want those results to come back. I want to pick those results back up, and I want to have somebody else be able to evaluate whether or not the test failed, not on the system under test. That's the wrong place to do that evaluation. On, on the system under test, it has to do only what you want it to do, what you want it to test. So what I want to do is I want to bring that back to me, and then I want to be able to evaluate the result locally, or I want to re evaluate it not on the system under test. So what I've cooked up, I spent a couple of hours, and I built this, this framework, another, yet another framework, yes, mm -hmm. it's true. Um, let's get rid of a bunch of files. Pardon the tidiness here, we get tidy up. And there we go. But I approach this, I approach this from, uh, from, from a class perspective. You're still looking at this screen. Thank you very much. Every time I go and in, uh, go into project mode, uh, encapsulation of the test environment that I want to have, so I can actually have a test that I throw to wherever I want to throw and have it execute. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay. I should have less. Uh, and then I have a test driver, which enqueues and dequeues the tests that I want to test, and throws them to a run space. And it throws only the very smallest amount of information to a run space to execute. And in fact, this code here is the creation of 10 tests in a single sweep. Don't get too uh, tied up in this um, uh, funny story I'll tell you if we have time. Anyway, this, uh, this is a test sweep. It tests, the multiple, it tests multiplication in a couple of different ways. Actually, it tests it against itself. It's, what's really happening here is I'm creating, these are the two lines of importance. I have a test script block, and I have a value, an evaluator to script block. The test script block, we create a script block, and the only thing I think, the only thing that gets sent to the system under test is that little script block. And in this particular case, it's going to have a random number generated, and it's going to multiply it by 30 times the number of which object it is. And that's all that goes across to the, to the system. And then I have another evaluate. I have an evaluator script block which says, "I will check your response. I will check the answer." This can be as complicated, complex as you need it to be, but the thing that's most important is that the test remain as only what you need the test to return, not whether it was successful. You don't want to do that evaluation on the remote system. You want to make sure that you do as very little as you possibly can. So let's see here. I have import this guy. Good. And we're going to go and execute this. Go. Let's see if this works. Yep. So go. Okay. Well, that was pretty. Um, what this represents is this represents throwing each one of those tests out to a remote run space locally on the system. I don't trust the network. Mm -hmm. um, but each one of those, those tests was executed in a remote context. The result was returned and then evaluated locally in this, sh in this shell session. So I actually have 10 different sessions. So those are the sessions that I'm using on this local system. But the point of this is that what if you have 500 instances in Azure? What if you want to spin up 500 instances in Azure and you could run your, uh, your tests in 500 instances in Azure? Remember, I have a problem, right? I, it takes me 18 hours to run my tests. 
18 hours to run tests because I'm running 100,000 of them. If I could reduce that to two hours, think about how much the developers will like that. When the developers you know, have to wait for the next day before they can say, yep, test passed, you can check in. Wouldn't that be nice if they could come in in the morning, start a test pass, come back from lunch and say, yep, your tests are good, go ahead, check in. So the point behind this is that if we can go down a path where we result, where, where we test only what we need to test, retrieve and you do it parallelly, we can really save a lot of time. It also allows the, <coughs> me the, the chance of throwing things, throwing only what I need to test. So if I don't have language elements, all I have is get date. All I have is one command on this remote run space. I can send that there and test that only. And that allows me to uh, reduce the burden of what I need to put on a system under test. It's really important that we move forward with this because we're only going to add more tests. It could be 300,000 tests in a few years if, I get, if we do the right thing, maybe. <laughs> but if we add too much functionality that we need. Previews 12 times a day. <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm hoping that we can go. That's kind of the place I'm trying to, to, to drive us. Uh, having your feedback uh, along this line would be very, very useful. I'm going to tidy the code up, and I will be releasing it. So uh, it should be very easy to do. Uh, I actually had it working against Azure instances already. So I know it's possible to do this. Any questions? Uh, I'm kind of out of time. I ran over. Yeah, let's, um, let's let him get unhooked and yeah. let the next speaker come up, and he can take some questions while we're setting up the next one. And if you want to grab a coffee, uh, you can do that then, too. <laughs> Sorry about that. No problem.